Now, I've said that in the 20th century, utilitarianism was, uh, uh, you know, ramified. It broke. It was broken open, analyzed out into a variety of, uh, of, of parts, and then how do these parts relate to each other, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, let's uh, just continue with that. So, uh, here's uh, uh, just a little bit of a schematic, just one part of the story, because as I'm as I'm trying to get across, it's a, it's a complicated uh, history. So utilitarianism breaks into act and rule, as we saw, and then I'm, I'm just going to put the rule utilitarianism to the side, and then act utilitarianism breaks into act consequentialism and some ranking welfareism. So I'm just following chapter five in the Cambridge Companion. Again, there are other ways to organize this history. This is just going to give you a bit of a flavor of it. So act consequentialism uh, formulated roughly as S, S is a subject, ought to perform X, X is an action, hence act consequentialism, if and only if, you know, provided that it is the case that the outcome of X, X's outcome is greater than, or is, is better than, or greater than uh, uh, not X's outcome. So it, as you can see that uh, it, 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 it's already lending itself to a more technical kind of view. We're talking now about a variety of, uh, of certain concepts that are involved uh, and, and they're going to have to be unpacked in more, more detail. So the second part that uh, act utilitarianism breaks into is some ranking welfareism. And here it's the outcome Q is better than or greater than outcome uh, not Q if and only if Q's welfare is greater than not Q's welfare. So there's just a rough schematic of, uh, of how act utilitarianism breaks down into act and some ranking. And in this sense, uh, we've got a number of concepts to try and clarify. And so, uh, you know, for instance, um, as I mentioned earlier, reading, cons talking about consequences, talking about actions, you know, what exactly is an action? How do you determine its boundaries? What exactly in our experience is going to count as a consequence? And how far into the, uh, how, far, how long in time do we uh, uh, talk about consequences of a given action? So these things don't just, it, they're not self-evident. So what exactly do we mean by uh, an action and an alternative uh, action. How do we make those distinctions? Um, so that in this sense, like, what do I mean exactly by the not X, like the, the not, like, do we have to consider all other possible actions? Um, and how do the act possibilities relate to the subject, right? You know, is this the stuff the subject does know or should know? Anyways, there's a lot of things to unpack here when you try and think through utilitarianism and going beyond Mill and thinking through all the things that uh, he mentions, but uh, he doesn't articulate in detail because it's very difficult to conceptualize these things. So, um, so what exactly does an outcome? What, what does that term really mean? Well, there's lots of discussions of this. And finally, um, when, I, when you think about uh, welfareism, what, what exactly are we talking about when we talk about welfare? Well, that term in 20th century utilitarianism is closely related to this other term, well-being. Um, this well-being is arguably one of the key terms in 20th century uh, utilitarianism. And there's two more, but I mean, I'm just going to talk about two issues uh, of dealing with the term well-being. We can call the uh, the first one is the is the problem of interpreting it, and and which I'm going to talk about in a moment. And then in the next video, I'll talk about uh, the, uh, the the problems of aggregating it. Right? How do you add it? How do you add it up so that you can talk about uh, uh, you know like because here. We have a, you know, a kind of mathematical type relationship because you're talking about uh, one aggregate of welfare being greater than or more than uh, another aggregate. So how do we get these aggregates of welfare? How, how, do we, uh, how do we sum them up, right? And you know, so how are we, you know, what are we doing when we, when we rank and sum uh, welfare? Um, so in, in terms of the interpretation of well-being, we have uh, a subjectivist and an, an objective uh, way of looking at it. And so in the, in the tradition of utilitarianism, uh, largely they, they were 
when they were talking about uh, about happiness and all these kinds of things that have gone on to be you know covered by the topic of, of well-being if you look at Mill and Bentham they were largely hedonists they were really talking about uh, uh, about pleasures right and um, in in that sense you know those things are hard enough to to analyze if you go when you read Mill and Bentham there's problems of trying to analyze you know levels of pleasure and how that's going to work um, but Mill is is not entirely clear uh, exactly what he means by pleasure in in all these instances. So, so as I said, you've you've got your subjectivist and your objective ways of interpreting. So how how what does it mean to interpret it in a subjectivist interpretation? Um, well, that's not entirely clear. So even these two main modes of interpretation have a variety of, of discussions and arguments. Uh, within them. One of the ways of interpreting this subjectivist uh, concept of well, welfare or well-being is uh, in terms of preferences, so that people can have preferences satisfied. So that gives rise to a certain form of utilitarianism called preference utilitarianism, preference satisfaction utilitarianism, um, which is essentially looking at uh, well-being as people getting uh, essentially um, what they want or getting uh, getting being satisfied but if you start thinking about it um uh, what is what does it mean to get what you want you know we'll often say yeah i want to get what i want and we think that i mean that's basically more or less a tautology but what does it mean to really be satisfied in your your wants is it just buying uh particular goods is that is that all that that means is uh, is it a goods so right there is satisfaction ultimately reducible to the acquisition of goods that you want, right? So as long as I can go into the stores and buy everything I want, um, uh, then I'm getting what I want. So it's, it's a good-based satisfaction. That's one way of understanding well-being. And um, it's not, uh, not surprisingly, that's often favored by uh, people in, in, who study economics, economists. They often talk about, you know, people getting goods and having access to... Uh, to goods and material products and, and living a satisfied life uh, through the acquisition of, uh, of getting the things they want. So, um, but is that the, the whole story um, of, do we want to unpack well-being along the lines of, uh, of uh, purchasing power and acquisition of goods? Well, you, you might, but is that going to be the whole story? But, you know, often we talk about people buying on getting all the things they want and they're still not necessarily happy with their lives. So is well-being something of, of a different kind uh, rather than a material one? Instead of preference, satisfaction, and getting stuff that you like, maybe what life or well-being has to be unpacked in terms of life satisfaction. And so, you know, what do we want? Of course, think about that question. Um, you know, uh, what do you want in life? You know, what, what does it mean to be satisfied in, in life? How are you going to interpret that? So, a, a term that seems relatively easy to handle at first, you know, all of a sudden now we're talking about trying to, to weigh uh, things that are going to lead to a, a, a happier life in terms of like a better life. Uh, how, how are you going to unpack that? And, and think about uh, this from another perspective. If you uh, un unpack uh, uh, the notion of a, of a good life purely subjectively, it can uh, uh, lead to funny results because, after all, um, people uh, people often make strange judgments about their lives and what it, it what constitutes a, a good life. Uh, in the sense that uh, you know you could uh, uh, talk about you know two people that one person has all kinds of material goods and um, it, and and let's say. Somebody is, uh, let's say, a guy named Joe is, he's, he's vice president of a company, he's making lots of money and he's got all kinds of things, um, but he's mad because he's only the vice president and, uh, and, and not the president of the company. And then um, maybe, uh, you know, Sam is, uh, uh, you know, has a much tougher life overall, but is really happy and, and pleased to, about, about his life. He's nowhere near vice president. He's just got a very job way, way down on the, on the ladder of things, um, but is pleased about it. So, um, how are we going to talk about well-being? Like, like we, 
and and programs that go to help people and and how do we make those judgments if uh, if let's say somebody uh, uh, like Joe you know doesn't think he has much well-being and then the other guy who's way down below thinks he's got a great sense of well-being should we adjust policies to help those that simply don't think they have well-being when materially they're in much better shape so this can lead to all kinds of problems when you try to apply the theory if you go down the subjective uh, way of interpreting well-being but there's that's just scratching the surface there's a uh, a lot that depends on on interpreting well-being even in the subjectivist one because it also it also relies heavily on the cognitive capacities of, of the, the subjects in question who are interpreting their own well-being. That is a big problem in, in a variety of developmental projects where people can think things are better and the projects are better than they really are. So human beings and their beliefs and their desires and their preferences to use that as the uh, fundamental notions or way of interpreting well-being can uh, indeed be a uh, quite problematic in a variety of ways. So anyway, so that's, that's just the beginning of the discussion. It certainly doesn't stop there with respect to the subjectivist interpretation of well-being. What about the uh, other way of going? Some people said, well, we should, uh, we should assume that uh, uh, the subjectivist way might be too, exactly that, too subjective. We want a more objective standard. So maybe we'll have a list of kinds of things that constitutes the good life. Well, you can see immediately what properties are going to be there and who uh, and how are you going to determine this uh, uh, list of, uh, of uh, you know, objective properties such that if they're met, you know, a, a life is satisfactory. What if, what if a given life uh, meets those properties and the person still isn't happy? Would you say, well, you have well-being even though you don't think it? Um, that seems to be a bit odd and counterintuitive to say that a person could have a good and satisfying life and still not be happy about it. So it seems like you, that to run one or the other seems to, uh, uh, to be missing something. All right, so that just is, is scratching the surface there on this concept of well-being. And in, Incredibly important one in the 20th century regarding uh, uh, utilitarianism because if you want to apply it, you're going to need some kind of understanding or agreement on the term uh, well-being. Um, so that's your first issue, and then in the next in the next video, I'll talk about the second one. As just again, just a brief overview of some of the problems of trying to even if you agree on what it means, the problems now arise of how to aggregate or sum up this notion of well-being to make sense of these kinds of relationships.